continuing to study the book of James. And James is such a practical book. It has so many practical applications. And I'm just going to kind of back up. And what we've seen so far is we've seen the heart of James. The heart of James is that we become mature followers of Jesus Christ. That we have a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And so he started out by talking about temptation and how we can need to consider it pure joy. And that, I'm sorry, not temptation, trials. And how we have to consider pure joy when we go through trials. And that trials produce maturity in our lives. And then he went on to talk about temptation. And how it's not God who tempts us, but it's our own sinfulness that causes us to fall into temptation. Um, But with God's strength, we can overcome that when we become doers of the word. He talked about, we talked about also being doers of the word, being word doers, living out the word on a daily basis. And we're going to pick up in verse, in chapter 1 of James, in verse 25. And I'm going to ask you to read with me as um, we go through James chapter 1. We're going to read chapter 1, 25 through 2, verse 13. Listen to what it says. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, This man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blasphemy the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I want to start off by just looking, going back to 125 through 27 there for a second. We're going to see a word that pops up twice here, law of liberty, and we'll touch on that later. But what what James is getting at is this. He's telling the people, he's telling them, be doers of the word. And he goes on to say, you might think you're religious because you do this and you do that, and you go through the religious motions of going to church and meeting together and all this, but he's saying, when you're talking about being a doer of the word and putting your faith in action, he's talking about living it out. And he uses the example of true religion being what? Taking care of widows and orphans. Now, I think it's interesting that he uses widows and orphans. Obviously, I believe that there was a need there because back then they didn't have Medicaid, Medicare, MediShare, whatever you want to call it. All, they didn't have programs. They had to take care of those people. Families had to take care of those people, and the church stepped in and took care of those people. But what he's saying is this. To put your faith in action, to be a doer, when you give to a widow and orphan, you're not going to get anything back in return. And what he's saying is that when we give, and we give to other people, you're not going to get anything back. Don't expect anything back. And a lot of times, that hinders us from giving, doesn't it? Because we say, well, I'm going to give to you because I'm expecting something in return. 
But I love the fact that he uses widows and orphans because widows and orphans can give nothing in return. And then he says, not only that, but true religion also says that, he says that, and don't let yourself be polluted by what? By the world. In other words, don't let the philosophy of the world come into your life and into your assembly, into your church, and affect you as a follower of Jesus Christ, affect your maturity and your faith, but do the opposite. And that's where we jump into, into chapter 2. And today we're going to be looking at 2, 1 through 13. And in verse 1, he says this, My brethren, do not hold your faith in, your, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And then he goes on to talk about, as we read earlier, about if a wealthy man were to come into a, a church or a wealthy person come in and you see well-dressed and you see them all well-groomed and you go to that person, you take good care of them, but you, the poor person who can't, maybe walks in not looking nice, not well-dressed, you kind of set them aside. And that's what he's talking about in personal favoritism. And let me just tell you this, personal favoritism is everywhere. We grow up with it, don't we? Um, how many have heard this saying, teacher's pet? I'm just curious, raise your hand if you were a teacher's pet. Raise your hand if you know, oh, look at this hand. You know, I, I see more girls' hands going than guys. What's up with that? <laughs> I was the furthest thing from a teacher's pet. I was not my teacher's favorite ever. And I don't know what it feels like. But you know what? I, feels like, well, I, I know what it feels like to not be one of the favorites. And, but the whole idea here is he's talking about personal favoritism. And let me just give you the main idea. This is what I believe that James is saying to us today. This is what James is saying. He's saying if you practice favoritism instead of merciful love, you are denying the very principle of our faith. In other words, if we do not show mercy, if we don't show love, we are denying the very principle of our faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because God showed us what? He showed us mercy. He showed us grace. God loved us just the way we are. And if we do not show mercy and love to other people and accept them for who they are, then we're not acting on God's character and God's nature. That goes the opposite of what God intends for us to do. So what is personal favoritism, actually? Let's just kind of define it. Personal favoritism is this. It means receiving someone by what they appear to be. Receiving someone by what they appear to be. And at the same time, as we see in verse, is it verse 4? Yes, verse 4. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? The idea of seeing people, accepting people as they appear and having ulterior motives. Aha! This person can offer me something. This person is this. This person is that. They're successful. You know what? They can help me climb the ladder of success if I attach myself to them. And in the world that we, I believe this is why James is saying, don't let yourselves be polluted by the world and jumps into personal favoritism because I believe in the culture in that day and in our culture today, we're inundated with it. Think about the workplace. If you want to climb that ladder of success, what do you do? You try to choose who you're going to connect with to help you get there. If you want to climb the social ladder of success, you try to find out who's popular, who's cool, and, and, and that's who you're going to connect to. That's who you're going to spend time with. You're going to attach yourself to that person. And so we start having this idea and this mentality of partiality, and we grow up that way. We grew up that way as kids. Think about as a kid growing up in this playground. There were the favorites. Going to work, everything, all through life, we have this, we deal with this personal favoritism, this partiality, and it goes completely against the nature and character of God. And so what happens is it creeps into the church. It creeps into the church, and that's what James is dealing with here. He's saying, you guys are being partial and you're playing favorites according to who's coming and you're choosing people and you're focusing on those people because 
of how they appear. But not only about how they appear, but you're thinking, what can they offer me? What can this person get me? And you know what? I see it in the church. I grew up in the church. I've been going to church since I was a little tiny guy. I grew up in a Christian home. My food was Christian. My dog was Christian. My cat was Christian. You know, I grew up in a Christian home. I've gone to church my whole life, and I have seen it in the church. Someone walks in, and the pastor sees a guy who's got looks successful. He just pulled in with a Mercedes Benz, and they're going, oh, yeah, offering's going to be good today. You know, let's make sure we make that person feel welcome. Maybe they'll keep coming back. Or maybe it's somebody who's got a lot of talent. They're, they have abilities. Um, they're, they're eloquent. They can speak. They're a leader. And we see, oh, wow, that person's got potential. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect to that person. I'm going to pour into that person. And I'm going to really make that person feel welcome because I want them to stay here. We start having these ulterior motives. Or maybe we come to church because it's a social place. And you know what? I need to socially climb the ladder in church. And I'm going to find who's involved and who's active. And I'm going to attach to them because I want to be known. And so we start seeing, receiving people and accepting people by the outward appearance for ulterior motives. And let me tell you a story found in 1 Samuel. You can turn there or you can just listen. Found in 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is a story of Samuel. Samuel's going to find a new king for Israel. And what he does is he's going to the house of Jesse. God tells Samuel, go to the house of Jesse because out of the house of Jesse, you are going to find the new king for Israel. So Samuel goes to Jesse's home. He walks in. Jesse had like seven sons. And, and, and Jesse's, one of Jesse's sons walks in. And, and this guy, Eliab, one of Jesse's sons, his name was Eliab. Eliab was a stud muffin. He was well built, buffed. He was tall, handsome. And when he walked into a room, people stopped and turned and said, okay, that guy's got, got it together. He's one of those kind of people. Uh, Samuel sees this guy and thinks to himself, surely that is going to be the king of Israel. Because outwardly, he looked like a king. And God spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, man, this is what he says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Isn't that true? That is so true, isn't it? We're guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. And so all of a sudden, I start making distinctions by how people appear, and I overlook the heart. I remember a pastor, I was reading a story from a pastor, and he was talking about how one Sunday he was preaching in the, in the church, and in comes this guy who looked like he just walked out of a garbage bin. He was dirty, grubby, and he comes in, and he sits down, and he's watching this guy thinking, uh-oh, we could have problems. You know, the guy had this look on his eyes, and he wasn't sure and he thought, where's the deacons when I need them? You know, we need to have them ready to jump on this guy if something happens. And after the service, the man came and talked to the pastor. And this man was the complete opposite. This man had a heart for God, had a passion for Jesus, loved the Lord. And the pastor said, I was completely humbled. Because here I had, distinct, I had uh, distinguished this person. Or I had stereotyped this person a certain way. And this person had nothing to offer me except for problems. That was the mindset of the pastor. And I believe that we do that, and that's what was happening here in James. And that's what James is talking about. And unfortunately, as this creeps into the church, it affects the life and the quality of us as a family. And so what I want to talk about this morning is we're going to look at James, and we're going to see in this chapter, or in these 13 verses, we're going to see how James shows us what genuine faith and mature faith looks like when we're talking about personal favoritism and what we should do. So the first thing is this. Genuine faith or mature faith is this. It is not partial. It is not partial. That goes against the character and the nature of God. It's the opposite of what God thinks and believes about every single person. And I know that for a fact because if God were partial, I wouldn't be standing here right now. I wouldn't be here. And so I just want to share some verses with you. You know, we're called to live like Christ. We're called to be imitators of Christ. And in John 7, verse 24, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. In, in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, For there is no partiality with God. 
And then Deuteronomy 10, 17 says this. I love this verse. It says, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not what? Does not show partiality. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, it says, God has chosen the weak things to shame the strong. And so we see here that the issue that was going on with partiality and favoritism goes completely against God's nature. Because showing partiality and favoritism is, he, he, James goes on to say is that it's evil. It's an evil thought because it's selfish motivation. It's being selfish and it's thinking of ourselves. And James goes on to say, look, why are you catering to the rich? They're the ones that are mistreating you. They're the ones taking advantage of you. They're the ones that are taking from you, sending you to court. They're doing nothing to, it's good for you. All they're doing is harming you. But here you've succumbed to the whole idea of accepting someone because of their outward appearance. The next thing he says is this. In verse 8 through 11. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. I love the two commas there. He says, if, comma, however, comma, if you are following the royal law and loving your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. You are doing right. You're doing the right thing. And what he means by that is this. If you are following the royal law, see the royal law in, 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 in Luke, I'm going to give you an example of this. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, Jesus is talking with some Pharisees, religious leaders, and this lawyer comes up, and this lawyer, he knows the law. He knows the commands of God. He is studying them deeply. And he asks Jesus, he says, Jesus, what is the great commandment? What is the greatest commandment? And what did Jesus say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the, 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 the lawyer, this, this man trying to trap Jesus says next, well, okay, yeah, that's true, but here's my question. Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And then Jesus goes on to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. And you've probably heard the story before, but he's talking about this man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and as he's traveling, some, some bandits come out. They beat him up. They steal his credit card. They take all this stuff, the keys to his Ferrari, and, and they take all this stuff, and, and they leave him wounded, beaten, and he's laying on the side of the road, and this Jewish priest comes by on his moped, and he sees the guy laying there, but he drives right past because he can't get clean, his hands dirty. He's a priest. And then all of a sudden, a Levite comes by, on, on his Kawasaki, and as he goes by, he also sees this guy, and he says, you know, I can't help him, and he moves on. But here comes a Samaritan. A Samaritan in the culture, and Jesus uses a Samaritan on purpose because a Samaritan in the Jewish culture was considered a dog. They were considered a half-breed. They were looked down on by the Jewish people. And Jesus says, this Samaritan man, he sees him, he stops, he says he had compassion on him, took him, put him on his own horse or his camel or donkey, whatever it was, and bandaged his wounds, took him to an inn, and he paid for the innkeeper to take care of this man until he'd come back. And then Jesus turned and looked to the lawyer and said, which of these three was a true neighbor? And his answer was, well, the one who had mercy. Who had the mercy? The Samaritan. The one that was looked down on. And what Jesus is saying here, and what James is saying, is that we are called to love others as ourselves. And that's the royal law. That kind of encompasses the law in a, in a totality. And I think it's interesting that Jesus said this, because I think Jesus knows the nature of humans. Think about this for a second. He says, love your neighbor as who? He didn't say, love your neighbor as you love your dog, or love your neighbor as you love your cat. Or love your neighbor as you love your car or your house. What does he say? Love your neighbor as, help me out. How, who? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Say that again. Yourself. yourself. 
Now, who of us loves themselves? Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, we got some bold people here. Yeah, we love ourselves, don't we? We do. In fact, I know I love myself because this morning I took a shower. I brushed my teeth for your sake. I, 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 I put on clean clothes. I even I had my shirt ironed this morning. Um, I'm doing really good. Why? Because I need to take care of myself. I fed myself an awesome breakfast this morning because I love myself. I, 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 I care for myself. And God says, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, we're called to treat people, care for people the same way we would care for ourselves, the way we would want to be cared for and loved and accepted. And that goes all the way back to the heart of God because God does not show partiality. And it's kind of like in a family. And that is God's heart, and that's what James's heart was for this family of believers that were coming together. We here at Palm, uh, I'm sorry, not Palm City, Stuart Coastal Life, we are a family. And we come together as a family, and a family accepts each other unconditionally. Those of you who are married, you know what I'm talking about. My wife loves me unconditionally. She doesn't look at me in the morning and go, you look bad, you know? Uh, no, my wife accepts me unconditionally with all my dysfunctions, with all my problems. Families do that, don't they? Parents, you love your kids with all their dysfunctions, with all their problems. Some of you kids are going, I have dysfunctions? Yeah, um, yeah you do. Trust me. And, 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 and we, we, but we love them. Why? Because we're a family. And I believe that is the same thing that James is trying to communicate to this assembly of believers you are a family. You're called to love one another and accept every single person, rich or poor, cool or not cool, untalented or talented. It doesn't matter because we all have something to offer one another. And we all have something to give. In fact, Jesus tells his disciples in John 15, 12, he says this, he says, love each other as I have loved you. Love each other as I have loved you. And the best way I can demonstrate this, I love the story of the rich young ruler. Jesus um, has a, a rich young ruler approach him, and, G, and the guy says, hey, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, obey the commandments. Aha, I love this. He says, obey the commandments. And Jesus lists off all these commandments. He says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, honor your father and mother, um, he had some other ones, but in all those commandments that he says, they all have to do with people around you. So for some crazy reason, Jesus leaves out the ones that focus vertically on his relationship with God. And the young man says, well, guess what, Jesus? I've done all these. I've done all these. And then Jesus says this. He says, okay, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And what happened at that moment? The rich, rich young ruler ducked his head and walked away because he could not let go of his wealth to give to the poor. And at that point, Jesus was making a statement. You didn't make, keep all the commandments. You did not love your neighbor as yourself. You are not willing to give up your wealth for your neighbor, for the poor. The one thing God cares most about, you aren't willing to give up. And Jesus is making a point by saying, you know what? He goes on to say, it's, more, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. And he was making a point that this young man, this rich young ruler, completely eliminated himself because of his actions. Because of his actions. And that's where we find ourselves in verse 9. Verse 9, look what it says. So in verse 8, he says, if you do this, if you love your neighbor yourself, you are doing well. You're doing God's will. Then he says in verse 9, though, but if you show partiality, you are committing, what's the next word? Sin. Ooh, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Jesus, James, I'm sorry, hits it from two different angles. He says, if you are showing partiality, you are committing sin. And because of that, the law calls you a transgressor. 
And he's actually hitting two different angles. He's basically saying, you've committed sin, which basically means you have completely missed the mark. You've completely missed the mark. And then he goes on to say, the law tells you that you're now, it says that you're now a transgressor, which means you've gone beyond the law. You've gone beyond it. You've surpassed it. You've gone around it. And you haven't followed it. And then what we see next, verses 10 and 11, is this. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So in other words, what he's saying is, look, you committed one sin, guess what? You're a lawbreaker. You are a lawbreaker, and you're guilty. You've missed the mark. And he's calling partiality, showing favoritism, sin. Why? Because it goes completely against the nature and character of God, of who God is, and what God teaches us. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I get caught in this trap of wanting to choose what I want to obey. Anyone like that besides me? You know, God, I like this. I can obey this. But this over here, well, God, you know what? I really don't want to obey that. But it doesn't work that way. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're called to walk in what? Obedience to God on a daily basis. And we'll touch on that in a second. We'll touch on that in a little bit. But what we're seeing here is this. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8 for a second. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Because what we see here is James is trying to tell them, look, if, you, if you've broken the law once, you're, you, you're a sinner, you're a transgressor. And, and, um, and, and just because you might do everything but fail in one area, you're still a sinner and a transgressor. It doesn't matter. But look what it says in verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. So in other words, he's saying, so speak and so act. Live your life in such a way. Live your life and act in such a way, recognizing that one day you're going to be judged, but you're going to be judged by what? The law of liberty. The same word we see in verse 25, the law of liberty. So let's find out what is the law of liberty. Look at Romans 8, 1 and 2. And it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in who? Who? Christ Jesus. He didn't say there is no condemnation for those who are abiding by the law because according to what we just read in James, if we are abiding by the law, living by the law, we would all be condemned because we would break it every time. But he's saying, no, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's freeing. That is really freeing. Then look, he says in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. The law of the Spirit of life in who? Christ Jesus. Not the law, but Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin. So what he's saying here is this. You are going to be judged. So live your life in such a way, but you're going to be judged by the law of liberty. And in 2 Corinthians 5.10 for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it, but in 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul is telling the Corinthians, and he's walking them through the comparison of the eternal life and the temporal life, and he says, this temporal life is short-lived, but one day you are going to be judged for your actions. All of us are going to be judged for our actions. And what James is saying here, live and act in such a way because you will be judged by the law of liberty. See, the law of liberty is different than the law. The law points out and shows us that we've sinned. The law of liberty gives us freedom from the law because the law of liberty is found through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ doesn't condemn us. He's not partial. He accepts us. And therefore, he has shown us what James finishes with here in 13, he has shown us mercy. And in, and in Matthew 5, 7, 
It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. See, what James is trying to communicate is this. God, in his mercy and grace, loves you, accepts you for who you are. Therefore, we're called as followers of Jesus Christ to do the same exact thing. And I want to close with an example in Luke chapter 18. You know, I, I love the heart of Christ. I love the heart of Christ. And as I read this story, um, this example, I just said, Lord Jesus, this is what I want my life to be like. But in Luke 18, verses 35 through 43, if you want to turn there, you can, or just follow along and listen. But it says this, as Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now, hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire, what was this? Or what this was? They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he called out, and those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? He, and he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. What's interesting about this story is I see me in this story. I picture me following Jesus. And all of a sudden, I hear this guy in the background as Jesus is walking and I'm talking to Jesus and listening. I'm being interrupted by some blind beggar saying, Jesus, Jesus, you know, who knows what he sounded like, but he was, he was frantic. He was yelling loud. He was yelling so loud. It was Everyone could hear him. He was interrupting what was happening. And these people are like, dude, shut up. You know, that's the Greek word, okay? They said, shut up. We're, we're, we're talking with Jesus. We're hanging out with Jesus, and you're interrupting that. You're a blind beggar. We see partiality happening right here in our midst. In this story, Jesus stops and says, what do you want? I want to see. And Jesus heals this man. And in Matthew, it says that he had compassion on him. He cared for him. And he healed this blind beggar. And then after he heals him, what happens? Everyone's praising God. Wow, look what just happened. But you know what? This blind beggar had nothing to give Jesus in return. Jesus gave him his sight. And this blind beggar is just like you and I. Because guess what? I have nothing to give in return to Jesus. Nothing. Jesus showed me his mercy, showed me his grace by dying on the cross for my sins. But I have nothing to give back to him to pay for that. And neither do you. And neither this blind beggar. All I can do is accept freely what he's given me and then in return, walk in obedience and trust him one step at a time and show that mercy and grace and love to those around me. And that is what genuine faith is all about. That is what walking in mature faith is all about. And that is what God is calling you and I to do every day. Now, I can stand up here in 45 minutes and talk about this. That's really easy, doesn't it? It sounds really exciting. But going out of this door and living it out, out there, and next week coming in here is another story. So here's my challenge for us this week. And not just this week, but for, this for our lives. Let's walk in mercy. Let's walk in love. When you see people that walk into this church building or you see somebody at a restaurant, don't show partiality. Don't judge them. Don't think, okay, what does this person have to offer me? They look like they have something to offer me. Guys, just so you know, I'm going to be really honest with you right now. I, I'm guilty of this. Just so you know, those of you who don't know me, I'm a missionary. I raise support. Um, I, I'm a, I work for the nonprofit missions organization, and I have to raise all of our funding. And a lot of times, I am guilty of looking at somebody going, ooh, they look successful. I saw the car he just pulled in. 
I need to connect to this person because they might be able to support our ministry. That's me showing favoritism. That's me showing partiality. You're laughing at me back there. But yeah, I mean, and I'm sure some of you have done the same thing, but I'm guilty of this. And I said, wait, that's the wrong attitude. The attitude God wants you and I to have is this. When we see somebody, it's what can I give them? What can I do to make their life better? How can I show mercy and grace and accept them for who they are, not expecting anything in return? That is the heart of Jesus. And that is why James speaks about this so strongly. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and we're going to close in a word of prayer. But right now, I believe today that the Holy Spirit is tugging on many hearts in here. I believe today that God's truth has penetrated many hearts and minds. And maybe, maybe you're like the blind beggar, and you can't see. Physically you see, but spiritually you can't. And here's the reason why you can't see spiritually. Because you have a problem, and that problem is called sin. You've, just like we talked about in James, you've missed the mark. You've missed the mark of living a perfect life by following the law, and, and you're a transgressor. You've gone beyond the law. And your problem with sin is now you are separated from God. You are spiritually blind and you can't see. And up to this point, you're bouncing off of this and bouncing off of that, trying to figure your way through life. You've probably made mistakes that you regret. But you know what? Today is a day of hope. Because the good news is this. The good news is that Jesus Christ, in his mercy and his grace, in his impartiality, he sees you, sin and all, transgressions, everything you've done, he loves you, he accepts you, and he died for you. And today you have an opportunity to respond to Jesus. And if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he wants to be a part of your life. He wants to rule your life. He wants to control your life. He wants to be a part of your everyday life. I made this choice many, many years ago, and it changed my life. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die today, that I would spend eternity in heaven. I have a peace in my heart about that. And you know what? You can have that same peace as well. And I want to invite you right now to say a simple prayer. This prayer, it's, it, they're words, but it, what matters is the attitude of your heart. And I want to invite you to pray with me right now. And just pray. Say, Lord Jesus, today I recognize my sin. And I admit my sin to you. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And today I give you my life. Jesus, thank you that you died not just for my past and present and future sins. You died for all of them. I thank you for that. Jesus, today, I choose to follow you. 